It is a tremendous material from which we can build almost anything. But it remains simply a great expanse of potential. In order that this matter shall become activated, shall have the power to produce out of itself something, or to be molded or made into something, there must arise between space and matter an intermediate power. And this intermediate power the ancients called mind. And mind was the beginning of the principle of form. For mind is the power which molding matter organizes it into forms. Therefore, wherever mind operates upon matter, there is form. And both mind and matter disappear in the form. And there is a new compound or a new substance that seems to appear. And this new substance is a species or a kind of life. For minerals, plants, animals, men, supermen, deities are compounds of mind and matter. And wherever these compounds arise, we have the emergence of tangible, growing, unfolding forms of life. The molding of matter by mind makes many wonders possible to us. And when the ancients interposed between the firmament of the fixed stars, the great spiritual agency, and the elements of, of the earth, earth, fire, air, and water, the primordial elements which they do, between these two they placed the mysterious septenarial hierarchy of mind. And they formed this mind out of the mystery of the seven planets. And this mind became, by its original power, the thinker. By its reactional power, the reflector. And therefore, by the will of mind, by the creative action of mind, things are generated and formed. But by the reflective power of mind, things are regenerated and reformed. And when mind reaches the point in its development, in which it moves from generation to, we might say, regeneration. When it passes from the conquest of matter uh, to the re, uh, revelation of itself through matter, it then moves into a level which we call psyche. And the soul is the regenerating, redeeming, transmuting power which arises from the reflective attributes of mind. So the angels had their seven planets which formed the rational focus. These seven planets gradually developed into the seven powers of the human mind, represented and throned in the seven parts of the brain, even as the seven powers of the spirit are located in the septenarial division of the heart. The mind, therefore, with its seven powers, became a second kind of creator, known as the Demiurgus or the God who creates formal things, in which the God of ages is to be enshrined, is to find its material sanctuary among men. This power of mind is variously represented in ancient philosophy. But I think that we consider, uh, in most cases, that this power of mind is particularly centered in the egoism of man. It is this power of mind by which man ultimately discovered his own identity, his own self-existence. And by establishing his own self-existence, he made the discovery that he was somewhere between heaven and earth. He had outgrown the earth, but he had not yet reached heaven. And he conceived, therefore, of a ladder uniting heaven and earth. The same ladder or the type of ladder that we find in the story of Jacob and his dream. This ladder was one upon which living beings ascend and descend. This ladder was the orbits of the seven planets that extended upward from the surface of the earth to the inner surface of the firmament or the empyrea. And these uh, seven orbits were the abodes of seven cosmocrators or deities of creation. <coughs> they were the ones who molded matter. They were the tyrants, the gods of old. They were the jealous gods of ancient nations, nations and races. They were the ones that, moving about the earth, sought and accomplished the organization of the earth. 
Among them, according to the Olympian hierarchy, the parts of the world were divided and distributed. They were given their kingdoms, their temples, their sanctuaries. From them, the ancient Hindus say, came forth the continents and the races of the nations each under the rulership of its own particular deity. But these deities in themselves simply represent the specializations of the seven powers of the mind, moving relentlessly but magnificently, ultimately to become the seven powers of the soul. Now this transformation of these seven as first appearing, focusing their energies upon matter, to produce creation, and finally becoming seven doors through which creation escapes back into a spiritual state. This strange difference, the descending and ascending powers of these planetary uh, arcs or arches are represented through the involutionary and evolutionary motions of energy. So in the initiation rites of ancient men, we find this set forth in such symbolism as the hymn of the robe of glory. We see man as a spirit, man as a divine being, a part of God. We find him descending in some systems voluntarily and in others involuntarily. But always that he is descending through the seven orbits of the planet, as he descended through the royal arches of England, to come finally to the earth and there to go to sleep in matter, and there to remain asleep for a certain time, and finally to awaken from this sleep as an infant, to pass through the seven ages which constitute physical life, and the seven stages which represent the seven degrees of spiritual evolution. We find, therefore, that these levels or stages or degrees are related to the seven churches which are in Asia and the seven golden rungs of the ladder that fell from heaven so that Muhammad could ascend through the gates of the Empyrean. Man, then, has this sevenfold mystery within himself. He is ascending through seven sta stages of consciousness, and he is returning gradually to the Empyrean, or to the heavenly state from which he came. He ascends through his own growth, through his own discipline and through the perfections of arts and sciences, for every labor that he performs is part of the septenary. Every degree of growth which he attains is part of it. His evolution through races, his evolution through religions, cultures, through great epics in history, all of these turn back upon the septenary, and all parts can be measured and determined by the seven levels of the soul by which it ascends to it, the light from which it came. These are the seven souls of the ancient Gnostic doctrine and of the Egyptian teaching about immortality. So we have man as a creature passing through an initiation ritual. He descends to the seven orbits, becomes locked in the abode of darkness, and then from darkness he reemerges. And in your doctrine of Neoplatonism, you find the seven steps of consciousness ascending from opinion through sense to knowledge and finally upward to illumination, which is again the perfection of the psychic life in man. Incidentally, and by all these points, it is curious that in the evolutionary process, it is not the personal life of man, but the psychic life which must be saved. It is not the individuality, but the universality of man which is important. And this, mu this must be brought ultimately and finally to its total liberation. So we have these orders of ancient planets, 